Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the latest Q&A session. Um, and luckily today we've got Selin with us. So Selin was um, with us at uh, Westminster Kingsway College doing the Professional Chef's Diploma. Um, and uh, Selin, can you just let us know when you were at the college? There we are. Now, okay. Yeah, perfect. So, <laughs> um, I was saying, I think, I think I left in two thousand and seven or two thousand and eight. Two thousand eight, okay. I think. Yeah, makes sense because that's when I started at the college teaching. So, I was aware of you, but I can't take any glory, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you give us a little bit of background to prior to college, what you were up to? Yeah, and then, and then your decision to, to move into hospitality and become a chef. Yeah, um, so I um, was very keen on sort of art and design at college um, or, or sixth form, should I say. Um, and I've got an older sister who's an art lecturer or used to be. And, and so um, from a young age, I kind of got quite involved in, in that side of things with her and um uh, I did a art GCSE at like I think I was like 13 years old or something in her evening class and so that was very much the route I was going down in terms of doing something uh, creative in the art world and um, and after doing my A-levels I did an art and design foundation for a year um, and in that year I guess um, I'd already been cooking at home a lot and was just very into cooking programs and making uh, dinner for friends and stuff and, and cooking books. Um, I was very, very passionate um, about it even even then. And, and I think in that year, it was a combination of uh, getting better at it, you know, a home kind of level. And then um, uh, and also uh, the lecturers at the, at the at the uni didn't like my uh, my work. So <laughs> I thought um, I thought uh, maybe this isn't this isn't a path for me actually, and I, and I and I was really keen from a young age to do something um, as a profession that I I was very passionate about and that um, wouldn't feel like work, you know, because you I think you see adults around you who are kind of stressed and grumpy and and stuff because it gets more stressful as you get older, right? But mm. and, and and sometimes people can really work is such a big part of your life that. Um, I found it very important to do something that I would enjoy doing and yeah so enrolled at Westminster Kingsway College and I remember really well within literally a couple of weeks I was um, you know I realised I'd made the, the, the right choice I was I was loving it um, from from that early on. Brilliant so um, both Simon and Vince say hello uh, yeah. via the, the question. Vince has asked a question about uh, your time at college. What was your most memorable point besides achieving your diploma? Um, I mean, quite a, quite a few, but whenever I, I think uh, back on my college days, I think the doing the competitions was was such a huge part of it um, and something that I um, enjoyed immensely. Um, it, I think I was competitive anyway, but that kind of <laughs> brought, brought it out in me even more. Um, and it's obviously great, you know, if, if you if you're doing well in them, and, and lucky for me, I was, and I had a very good mentor and Vince and uh, and in Simon as well, and um, so you know it's, but but more than that, more than the actual, you know, um, winning competitions or doing well in them, um, it was it was that it kind of opened up my eyes to different types of cooking as well, you know, so so there'll be different whether it's a different country or a different style of cooking or whatever it is, different ingredients. And it just meant that you were, I, I was learning more and more, you know, and so that's mm -hmm. why I was always very keen to do them because 
I wanted to learn everything and I wanted to be the best at everything. And so, mm -hmm. you know, um, doing the competitions was a, was, was, um, was, a, was a big part of that and ultimately led me to um, doing the New, New Zealand UK link competition, I'd say, which was the biggest highlight because um, through that, I won a five week trip to New Zealand and met Peter Gordon, who then became um, my boss for almost five years um, after leaving college. Yeah. So so um, your first job was uh, at the Providores? Yes. Yeah. And uh, and tell me about your relationship with Gordon or Peter. Sorry. Um, yeah, so he, he was the sort of the head judge. Um, I didn't know much about him, I think, when I uh, came to do the competition. Um, but I remember just before the competition kicked off in, and um, the, the judges were coming around and saying hello and introducing themselves and um, checking in on us. And, and, uh, and I remember he walked in and it was just like the it was a really strange experience because I hadn't come across a chef like that so far. Right. And mm. uh, and this is my third year in college, so I've, I've done various work experience and things by now and met some, you know, chefs outside of the, the college as well. And he was just so, um, so lovely, so nice and so warm, you know, and um, was really caring. And you got that immediately. He was actually concerned about, am I OK? Am mm. I settled in? You know, am I ready for this kind of thing? Do I need anything? And and I really got that off of him. And um and and uh, you know then then being in in New Zealand, I, I worked at or staged at one of his restaurants there, and um, it was through having a conversation with him, you know, while we were both prepping something that he said, "Oh, what are you going to do after college?" And I said, "You know, I, I'm looking for a job, but um, I just don't know where I want to work." And at that point, um, I loved and still do love all sorts of food. Um, and from all over the world and again I was very hungry to learn about food from all over the world because I think I knew I, I wanted my own restaurant but I didn't know in uh, what style I wanted to do yeah. or what cuisine um, and so working with Peter who um, you know is, has been referred to as the godfather of fusion cuisine was um, was was the perfect kind of way of learning about food from all over and um, and so he yeah he said to me come and do a trial at the Providores you know it's very different from here that was a that was a hotel uh, kitchen and so it was very spacious and very nicely designed and very calm and then uh, obviously a London restaurant is uh, Providores was in, in a tiny basement um, with just stuff in every single like nook and cranny and very hot and pressurized and stuff but um, so very different um, but but again doing I did a I did a double shift. For my trial and um, loved every minute of it. Um, and again, all the people that were working there were all really lovely, and 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 that really stemmed um, from Peter and his his ethos and the way that he runs um, kitchens and and treats people. Mm. Um, and that and that was that was really important for me because I think even a you know I was I guess uh, twenty I think when I started at college, nineteen or twenty um, at Westminster Kingsway. And I had, you know, I could have, I could have enrolled. I knew, I knew from when I was even 16 that I really loved cooking and there was an inkling of wanting to be a chef, but I was scared of getting into the industry and, and kind of the reputation um, that it had and, and has. But I think, you know, we've, we've moved on from that a lot um, over the last sort of 15 years or so. Um, and I think there's a lot of, uh, kitchens you know that get that now and and how it's important to nurture people and mm. and uh, not be mean to them yeah we work with people and actually if you treat them like people then uh, yeah exactly. you'll, you'll get somewhere yeah and, yeah and actually you know in working in that kitchen was um of course you're going to do things wrong people always do it's human nature and um it was more a case of pointing out what you did wrong so you learn for next mm. time and if it and they, they build such a connection with you that actually, you know, if, if you do something wrong, then you really feel like crap 
and you feel like I've let down this person rather than because they're not going to shout at you. They're just you can feel the disappoint and disappointment from them, which is which is kind of worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So would you say Peter's been the biggest influence on your career? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I think I've, you know, very much modeled myself on on um, on him and yeah, again, his, his ethos, the way that he works, the, the way that he um, cooks and obviously I, over the years I've developed my own um, style um, but the but again the way that I run my kitchens and the way that I treat people is very much in line with everything that I learned um, working with him really and, yeah. and my approach to food as well was you know he he doesn't set boundaries he doesn't set rules to anything um, and you know, if it, if it tastes good and then he'll put it together kind of thing. And, yeah. and my, my food is more structured because it's, it's you know, it's inspired by my heritage in a certain part of the world. But um, but that doesn't mean that I stop myself from using ingredient if I really want to use it and I see the benefits of it in that dish. Mm. So, so who else do you think has had uh, an influence on your career? Um, I mean, Obviously, I mean, I think obviously from from college, I I think in the hospitality world, you, you'll always meet, um, you know, people in, and there's there's one side of the camp that says uh, that, uh, you know, yeah, you need to do a couple of years at college and and then you can move on, which which is absolutely true. You can learn the basics, um, which is what we're all doing, whether you're doing a year, two years, three years, you're learning the basics. Um, but and then there's the other side that I think sees the benefits of it and that and I'm I'm in that camp that sees the benefits of going to college and going back to the beginning talking about the competitions and stuff like that and the and the extra work that you can get out of that um mm. and and spending that time I think that's the, those three years were really precious actually um and you as much as you put in is what you will get out of it you know and I think with anything in life obviously but very much so with with cooking you know we we know that it's a it's a very demanding job and so you have to put in a lot of hours um and a, just a lot of time a lot of energy and you know i from from college to to being a young chef in the providors kitchen i would finish up and then i'd go home and obsessively read books and stuff and and um and therefore learn more stuff from different sorts of chefs and yeah. different uh, cuisines and, and things but you know that time at college um, and and having some really great lecturers who taught me the foundations I think um, that that still very much stays with me um, day to day and that then going on to obviously working with Peter was was immense and the people that I met working with Peter you know Miles uh, Kirby who now own, owns um, caravan restaurants he uh, he was a head chef at the Providors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he spent sort of seven years, I think, there as a chef um, before finally moving on. And you kind of just don't really see that anymore, where people would put in so much time and um, and, and really learn something, learn yeah. how to be a part of a restaurant or run a restaurant before then going on to do their own thing. Um, so they're, they're definitely people I really look up to. And then also, you know, in terms of... Um, really great food. I remember um, Nieves who owns uh, Sabor. I'm not going to try and say her surname because I can't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, she's she's now become a, a friend of mine. But for years, I actually just absolutely idolised her and, and, and her cooking at Barafina. And I uh, would spend many an evening perched up against the bar just eating the food. And, um, and I was completely blown away with, with it. And that, I think that's when I really began to understand the very produce driven food um, and but really executing something like with full on flavor you know I think you think you can go to a lot of great restaurants and especially fine dining restaurants where everything will be executed perfectly but for me like I need my palate wants big punchy kind of flavors it's that's the sort of chef that I am and and um, her, her cooking really uh, really does that you know and um, it's it's really exciting um so that 
yeah, I think she's she also played a big part in, I guess, the way that I've the the structure of how I I run the kitchen as well with the with the with the way that it it works and the way that the things get finished on the pass and things um uh, I very much I think modelled a little bit on on her style. Yeah, so it seems quite a jump from uh, starting out at the Providors to to opening your own restaurant. So, what's the journey there? Um, yeah, it was it was a pretty quick journey for me. Um, really, uh, I spent just over two years at the Providors. Um, you know, I did my rounds on the on the sections. I started off in Lada, and then I went to uh, did about three months on pastry, and then um, and then there was two kind of main hot sections there, uh, hot starters and and the main section. And um, I guess it's a, it's a bit different. Well, pretty different from a traditional classical setup of a kitchen um in that you can you kind of you cook and you plate everything um yourself even on the main section like you did <clears throat> your meat and fish cooking <clears throat> and um and your garnishes and everything and and uh you know i think looking back on it um it was absolutely mental that <laughs> we used to do that <laughs> because it's just a lot of work for one person. We're talking about two different menus as well because in the ground floor was a different menu and upstairs was a different menu. And um, but uh, but that taught me without without a shadow of a doubt those two years really taught me to be like a proper chef and like to learn organisation um, and to learn your mise en place and, and setting up a section and, and actually understanding what a setup is and and every every day when I'm in the kitchens like that's still something that I go <clears throat> talk to my chefs about because there's there's what people's perception of being set up is and then there's being like you know set up for almost for war and like and that mm. and that was what you know working at the providors really really um taught me as well as obviously cooking different sorts of produce and things and um, so I, I did, I yeah did a full tour of the kitchen and ended up on being on the main section and sort of, I guess, was the equivalent of like a senior chef de party. And I wanted to continue, you know, progressing and learning and I wanted to get into um, some some management stuff to understand that. Um, and there was nowhere for me to climb in the Providors kitchen because there were two people above me who um, had been there for quite some time, so were Ju, uh, uh, Junior Sue and and Sue, and and so they uh, and they weren't going anywhere. So um, I was offered a job as a Junior Sue for a new restaurant that was going to be opening up, um, and it never did. And I guess my destiny was to go back and work with Peter because he opened up um, another another restaurant which is which is no longer around also but um Kopapa in Covent Garden and um I, I initially went out there to sort of help for six weeks or so and I kind of found myself in a position of of really knowing you know um they needed a sous chef and I knew how Peter worked inside out you know and and I think he found it really useful me being there and um and I was absolutely loving it you know and, and being able to I realized how much I did know um and so they offered me sue i accepted and i did that for just over a year and that was you know incredibly challenging um you know maybe maybe it was too soon maybe it wasn't i don't know i mean obviously it's all it's all worked out quite well for me in the end but um you know i i did find it very challenging and um it it, tell, it takes a long time to learn um develop your own style of, of management and and how you work with people um, and how you communicate with them and and I was 23 or 4 at that point um, and you know in a position where not everyone but quite a few people were older than me or um, or, or my age and and so then when you when you've got to tell someone what to do when they're older than you then that gets that can be a little bit tri tricky um, but yeah but I, I it was almost fast tracked and then so I, I just learned everything at kind of double time um, and then um, and then Lee who was the, the head chef there he, he left um, 
and so they thought about I think about hiring uh, a new head chef and I wasn't sure whether I wanted it or whatever but through discussions we kind of we kind of worked out um yeah they they offered it to me and I accepted I, I figured why not let's give it a go and see what happens um and um it was it was great it was again very challenging very very challenging and you know for the you kind of you go and I always say this to like to when I promote someone is like you, you go from being the the best in the kitchen right so if you're CDP or you're so you learn that position you do that for a while and you're the best at doing that in that position and then you go to the worst mm. of being the next step up right and so therefore it was like the worst head chef in that kitchen but the only one and um and I was getting things wrong you know I, I was making the wrong call and and it was it was very you know that restaurant I don't know how long did it last for four four or five years I think and um from from the day it began it was I think Peter would be would be honest as well and say that it was a very challenging um area of London to open up in and so financially it was it was a big burden on the on, on the owners and and then so there was a lot of pressure coming down on us and so it was incredibly demanding um and you just felt like you were never getting it right and then you know so that you, there were there were there were decisions that I made um at the time that that weren't right and but I learned through them you know and and it was for the first time I think in that year and a half or whatever that I was head chef there that that, that um Peter, Peter and I would sometimes sort of butt heads, and normally we get on like a house on fire. But <laughs> that that was quite a tough, quite yeah. a tough time. But I learned a lot through it. Yeah. Brilliant. And so, how did you end up opening your own place? So by that point, um, that was when pop ups were really taking off, um, and saw that there were um, yeah a few other chefs and, and kind of cooks and all sorts of things that were going on that were really exciting um away from just a restaurant um itself and I thought why didn't I give this a crack and just see if um see if people are going to be interested in my food and I think by that point I was more and more drawn to the food of my heritage so so my parents are from um North Cyprus so um it my food's based on yeah turkish kind of cypriot cooking and also uh across turkey and, and and in general like the middle east kind of thing as well um but it kind of was very much focusing in on at the time um and certainly the time that i opened up my first restaurant um was was about really um promoting cypriot food i think and trying to show I, I wanted to show people that there was more to that sort of food than just sort of kebabs and meza yeah, as delicious yeah, yeah. as they are <laughs> um there's obviously uh it's like how you know uh in india people will think that they're just curry and there's there's mm. not else there's yeah, a, yeah. it's uh, like chinese food in the uk is yeah exactly yeah yeah it's not till you actually go and um and experience it yeah. so yeah, and 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 through through um, different different chefs and different uh, restaurateurs who were opening up food re restaurants with food from like Peru or something, right? And at the time, like I think that's become quite normal to us now, certainly in London anyway. But at the time, that wasn't. Um, these were quite out there kind of foods that were coming into the city, right? And um, it's people it's the people who opened those restaurants that really kind of I think gave me more and more confidence to, to pursue that you know this dream of like having my own restaurant and um showcasing the food of my heritage and um so I yeah I just started contacting um loads of different spaces like pubs and um event spaces and all of that and a lot of the time I didn't even get a response um back it was yeah no no one sort of cared about where where I'd worked or what I'd done or anything like that um so it was real back to like yeah basics and it was and then I went on I guess like a two almost three year journey of like um 
trying to yeah do these pop-ups and build build my name up and um and I would do like a weekend here and there and slowly the door started to open and um I guess the biggest door in that time was a was I got a, um to do the six month resi residency uh, at a place in Haggerston just by sort of Dalston area and it was um in this railway arch and you know there was no one now that that strip has got um other bars and kind of restaurants and stuff but at the time it was the only space that had opened up um with you know and the, and the people who owned it were kind of next door was a yoga studio and they were kind of more into yoga and dance and stuff but they can kind of wanted to own this restaurant it was very it was all very odd and very challenging but I learned a lot from it and um in that uh, I put together a menu of kind of small plates inspired by my heritage and just started like cooking my heart out really and and experimenting um seeing what worked what customers liked and stuff and you know for the best part of six months it was very quiet and the the brunches that we did on the weekend went well and and stuff but um in the, in the week it was it was pretty quiet um and uh but although the people that did come um i got a lot of encouragement from them and, and they really loved the food which was great and then one evening um giles corran the reviewer from uh, the times booked in uh midweek and came in on a table of six and i think from then it was like then when that review came out i um i was expecting to get absolutely ripped apart um and he loved all but one dish i think from what i can remember mm. um and it just i was i think i was just in shock for like two weeks <laughs> as to what was going on. So, um it was it was incredible and i think that really turned around um where i was at at that time you know and then that gave me a real boost to then go okay well i, I can do this and this is a major um you know food critic who really loves the food that i yeah. that cook for him and and um so i started working on a business plan yeah and then kind of went from there really Brilliant. there's a there's a question that's coming from one of the students who's saying uh, how have have you kind of coped and what are the difficulties in in making your cultural dishes translate onto a plate and and how do you you do that to make it appealing for for everybody uh yeah it's definitely challenging i the, the the biggest challenges i face are um i've never claimed to do traditional um cypriot food or turkish food i i always say that i take inspiration from it and um, there are some there are literally a small handful of dishes um that i i will follow a traditional recipe um pretty much or, or a traditional way of making it sorry I form my own recipe off of it um and you know cook it in, in its traditional sense but um but then with those ones I will you know that was trial and error trial and error until I felt like I could do the best possible version of that dish if I'm gonna like if I'm gonna do it in a traditional way then it's got to be the best possible version of it um, and the rest of it is just very much taking inspiration and I always find it still to this day actually quite hard to define actually the sort of food that I do I just like to cook good food with big punchy flavours and it's kind of draws inspiration from that part of the world um, but I, I still get you know whether they're um, Cypriots or you know people from mainland Turkey or whatever kind of the biggest critics and they'll come and some some of them will will love it like half of them love it and love that there's someone doing that with the with the food that they're most familiar with and then and then half of them kind of will complain about the price because uh, they're used to like cheap turkish food <laughs> or mm. will complain um that you know this isn't how my grandmother make made it or whatever and i guess you learn to you learn to get thick skin right and at the beginning um i think for the first couple of years for sure that really really bothered me um, and i would take everything to heart um and now i just i just really don't <laughs> i think i think i've i know that there's enough people who enjoy and love the food that i make that um 
I'm like, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as soon as people love to label things and as soon as you kind of get labelled as a Turkish Cypriot restaurant, you're going to get the purists who come in and have their nostalgic yeah. moment of their, remembering their grandmother making it one way and yours is different. And it's it's the same the world over. I remember going to India and and expecting, having been trained kind of in a in a French style and, and everything's codified, I thought, brilliant, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to learn recipes and it's it, it's completely out the window out there. There's no codification of any recipes and actually yeah. even down to how they make garam masala is different family to family. So yeah, yeah. yeah interesting. So uh, so you opened in 2015, was it? Akava? Yeah. 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 Um, and then in 2017, you had Great British Menu. Yeah. Yes. So how did that come about? Um, how did that come about? That was the, so I finally made it onto the, onto the show on 2017 and, and, but two years before that, they'd asked me uh, if I was interested in doing it and you kind of go through a process where they, they call you up and they do like a phone interview um and then they would come film like a little video of you in a, in a kitchen like cooking a dish i guess they they want to uh piece together and see what you like on camera and then that gets taken to the to the bbc where they where they pick the final um three dishes so great british menu will suggest we'd like to put these chefs forward and and but the bbc make the final decision on it and um in two years before that, I guess it just wasn't the right time, and I and I didn't I didn't make it through to the to those rounds, and um, but I guess you know it all happens for a reason because I was very happy that it happened when I had my own restaurant and um, and with that brief of which was uh, um, Wimbledon um, celebrating Wimbledon, and uh, and and I think it was because you know I didn't I didn't have my own kitchen and I was still sort of starting out and stuff so. Um, when it did happen, um, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was definitely the, the hardest thing um, I've ever done because of the pressure that you kind of put on yourself. Um, yeah. And even though everyone around me was like, don't worry, you'll do great. And don't worry if you don't win, don't worry if you don't get through. But um, having watched the program from the day it started every year religiously, um, I knew that if if I made it, then it would transform my career and, and my restaurant, you know, yeah. with the exposure that it would get. And um, so there was a lot of pressure there. And um, but it was it was also, you know, it was really fun um, doing doing it. And and the biggest, the most work really has to go into, I think, does go into really creating those dishes. And that's over months of, of kind of work yeah. of really researching that brief and, and trying to make the connections. And um, yeah. And even, I don't know, it. I, there, there was a big dose of, I think, luck in there as well. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I'm really happy that I obviously managed to <laughs> get to the banquet with so, the with the dessert course, um, which was incredible. Um, so, just, so I, I mean, I remember watching it, and I, I recall your first. That wasn't your first dessert, was it? No, yeah, that was. <laughs> That was that's what I'm saying. It was, it was pretty lucky. The the first dessert, the judges absolutely hated it. Uh, I believe it was the lowest scoring dessert in in the in the regionals, and um, so I went into the the finals week and cooked it. And I remember cooking that, and I was so so grumpy that day because because I really I pinned everything. I thought my main course was was the one that if I was going to get a dish, I thought it'd be the main course, and I didn't get it. And then I just thought well, that I, this is it. My hopes are all dashed here because there's no way that I'm going to be able to get through a dish that they haven't even tasted before. I've had no feedback on, and uh, I made it. And then I remember, you know, you go you go through a whole day's filming, obviously, and uh, it's a long day, and you, you taste everyone else's food. And and I remember thinking like there was some really nice stuff, but I remember thinking, you know. I feel like I might have a chance because like it just felt like it would fit in with the rest of the menu that they'd picked so far and and I think it really captured like the summer vibe that they were after and stuff and um there was a couple of people I think who were doing like strawberry desserts but Tommy Banks had already won the 
uh, turbot with strawberries and cream for the fish. So I was like, there's no way that they're going to do strawberries and cream twice. So I was I was very hopeful when, when we went into the judges chamber, but still de definitely didn't expect it. But yeah, mm, amazing. And um, I've also seen that you've uh, won other awards since then as well. So uh, I won. The, the, the Turkish Cypriot Award. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh God, I don't know. That was. I, I actually have no information. On that. <laughs> <laughs> that was something I got invited to, which is very nice. Um, and yeah, it was. Um, and what's this most, exactly what, what, is it what does it recognise? <laughs> I think it was just recognising someone putting out. Um, yeah, someone uh, speaking up for the Turkish Cypriots, perhaps. Okay, uh, brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, a question is coming from the student saying, um, as a as a female in the industry, how have you how have you found it to be? I mean, have you found it harder, or uh, have you ever come up against any extra challenges? And have you got any advice for females? Um, I I'm very lucky. I think in my career that, um, like I say, I think I probably painted a bit of a picture of working with Peter. And um, one of the one of the biggest things was was the fact that there's complete equality there's no there was no laddish behavior there was no um you know you, yeah you have a laugh and a, and a joke with the people that you work with but it was a real creating a real family um and in fact at, at one point working at the providors it was it was a female dominated kitchen um and uh yeah being part of that was incredible and so i never really felt it uh, I knew, I've always known that that was the case. Um, I've, I think I felt it a little bit more at that point that I became sous chef at Copapa. There was a few situations there with some, with some tricky kind of laddish chefs that, and I hadn't come across people like that really before. Um, or certainly working for Peter, I hadn't come across people like that. And, and so those situations, um, were a bit difficult um but then you know i think my philosophy has always been and, and still is is to to just um head down and, and and learn your craft and make sure that you're better at doing it than anyone else yeah. and that will ultimately shine through um right. and be recognized uh because no one no one can can turn a blind eye to that um for very long and and sometimes it is very unfair and sometimes you might find yourself in in, in the wrong uh, kitchen or the wrong situation or with the wrong boss or whatever. And and I think like go with your gut on that, you know. And, and and if it really doesn't feel right, then I think as chefs, sometimes it's also kind of ingrained in you to really like stick it out. And you know, you don't want to you don't want to cave in. You don't want to give up on something. Um, but I always say to young chefs that I don't if if there's a situation that's really like causing you a lot of stress and anxiety and stuff and and, and especially in that in that context then I think you know find a job that suits you you know because you, you've got to be happy with what you're doing in the in the job and with the people that you're working all those hours with you know you see them more than you see your family so it's really important that you you like the people that you're working with and you respect them and they respect you mm -hmm. um so if you find yourself in that sort of situation, just go and find another job. Um, and and I would say that as much as I haven't really experienced it, um, I think in more recent years, just in the uh, in the in the in the restaurant world, in the very grown up restaurant world, and with with um, I mean awards and things like that, I think are quite a um, there's there's in subtle ways I notice it a bit more now I think in in terms of sometimes you can look at I've had my fair share I think of, of opportunities um but sometimes you can't help but look at certain other chefs male chefs who might get opportunities or get almost like a quicker there's almost like a faster ladder that they take sometimes um and I think that's you know to do with also the media and um yeah, a handsome man will always seem to get more exposure than than uh, than everyone else. It feels like, um, which I don't I don't want that to sound like I'm resentful or anything like that. But I just um, that's that's how I felt. I think in in 
in more recent years with stuff. Mm. And uh, where's your favourite places to go and eat then? Um, I love Kiln and Smoking Goat, the Thai places. I think they're both really great. Um, I love Sabor, um, Perilla uh, in in Stoke Newington, or oh, sorry, Newington Green, um, by the chef called Ben Marks, who used to work for Phil Howard. Um, he's a really, I think, doesn't get enough exposure. He's a really, really great chef. Um, there's also a place in Hackney called The Laughing Heart. Um, with Tom Anglesey, who was on Great British Menu last year, um, who does some really interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, loads of places. <laughs> I just, I love restaurants. Yeah, and have you got any advice for someone who wants to start their own restaurant, especially at the beginning? Um, learn your craft really well. Learn and 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 really think about what what it is that you want your restaurant to be the sort of food you want to be cooking um obviously it's been really nice doing this actually because i'm i've in that time that we've been doing this i've forgotten that there's a pandemic going on <laughs> right now <laughs> but um but that is the case so you know this <laughs> my advice here might slightly affect that um but you know really think about what what's going to set your restaurant apart um and what's going to really make it work um in a business sense and financially and you know i have uh, a business partner uh, laura uh who i adore because we just we she does all the excel stuff and all the front of house stuff and all the wines and whatever and everything and that basically allows me to concentrate on food and kitchen stuff um which is really important they're, they're both really really important but you need someone i think really by your side you can't do it you can't do it on your own, not successfully. Um, and because there will come a point where it will just come and bite you in the ass. So I think you really, <clears throat> I'd say, get yourself a business partner and and uh, and make sure it just it feels right. Because you know, I think when when you when you if you, if you get to a point where people are taking notice of your food and your cooking, um, then, then opportunities will start to come your way and people will want to offer you things and, and sometimes they can sound big and grand and, and, and things, you know, whether it be a head chef position or a, or a, a, a restaurant or whatever, they want to invest in you. But I think just, just take your time with it um, and, and really work out what it is that you want and where you want to end up. Um, whether that's one restaurant or a number of restaurants or whatever, like really understand um, restaurants and how to make money off of them, which is incredibly difficult. And um, yeah, the, the 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 size of what it is that you want to do, um, because it takes a long time to even get one really up off the ground and get it, you know, exposure and to so it has longevity um let alone if you're expected to do more than that one kind of thing yeah yeah, it's, yeah. there's lots of variables to it Absolutely. But, I, mean, no. I think i think it's crucial what you said about copapo and and the location and things like that and and how you you assimilate Covent garden with food and and restaurants and things like that but that doesn't i mean that means you've got the footfall in one sense but equally you've got so much competition and, it, yeah. and also a lot of that footfall, uh, especially in that area, are all um, tourists and tourists want uh, that their English will be limited and they're, um, they're normally on their way to something. So they want something quick and recognisable, you know, and that's why places that are doing like uh, burgers or pasta or pizza and whatever, things that are recognisable to everyone will um, will do a lot better around there as opposed to what we were doing back then, which was this like fusion food and people reading these dishes and have no idea what's going on with them, you know. So so then we had to adapt and when you start cooking this food that none of the chefs want to cook. And so uh yeah, it's a there's there's a real and um, there's a lot to learn. And I'd say actually if you want to have your own restaurant, then make sure you're a part of um try and be a part of an opening team somewhere. Like 
help her, uh, whether it's as a sous chef, head chef, whatever, or even as a CDP, like just be a part of it because it's um, it's really fun. It's a great experience. I think it's the most fun part of, of doing a restaurant is the is the opening, and then um, but you but you learn an awful lot through it as well for yourself. So there's a uh, students asked um, how you cope with um, if you're in a more senior position and things like that. You might come across people who may be older or who may have more or feel that they've got more experience and there's this kind of stubbornness and things like that. How do you deal with those sort of situations? Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, you, you it's horrible when that happens, I think. Um, it's horrible when it happens, but you kind of just see it as inevitable that it will happen and just make sure make sure that when it does that you're right and and you're you know how to do that thing and you have your reason for asking someone to do something a certain way or whatever it is and, and whatever the pushback is just you know it's it's always best to just kind of diffuse it and sometimes you know you don't even need to actually when you're at that level you don't need to um really stop and explain to someone why why you're doing that because you're in that position you're asking them to do it and so they have to do it and and um again you'll you'll grow a thicker skin through it i'd say mm. it's just a process i think that you kind of you have to go through um but knowing yourself as well that it'll be interesting to see what happens uh post pandemic but obviously we know that the the hospitality has been very short staffed for many years you know and and i know for myself running a business I have found myself in a number a number of times in positions where I want to kind of promote someone but I kind of because I need that position filled but actually you know they could do with another three to six months of actually learning that position but I fast forward it because I really need to fill that position because there's literally no one else and and it's and it's far better for everyone and, and as a company to obviously promote from within um but it also, you know, um, it's also great for, for the other chefs to see that as well. Um, but but also know for yourself, like if, if you if you're offered a position and you don't feel ready for it, then have a conversation with who's offering you that position, I think, and air your concerns around it. And I think, you know, that that's what I would that's what I always do with my chefs. Um, even though if I'm offering them uh, a more senior position, I'll always talk through it and kind of give them a rundown of what to expect and what and what it's going to be like. And the fact that they are going to face challenges like that, whether it be someone older uh, or someone who's been doing it longer, who, who's going to challenge them at times. And, um, um, and if you yourself feel like you can work with your you know, with your head chef on that um, and through those situations and you get that support that you need then go for it and but if you feel like your time's not quite there then then say no to it and learn a bit spend a bit more time in the kitchen continue learning yeah and that would be generally just your advice to, to all the the students as they finish college and and go off to yeah first jobs. yeah yeah I think um, it's just there's there's you can't you just can't rush it <laughs> you just can't rush um um yeah learning learning all the all the techniques and stuff and some people you know albeit some people will probably look at my career and think that i i um got to the point of having my own restaurant pretty pretty quickly but he like i did that i did that off off the back of the opportunities that i got and then Therefore, and then the feedback that I got off of my food and things like that. Like if if I started doing those pop ups and people weren't really interested in my food and I didn't get a review and blah blah blah, like I wouldn't. Then then I think okay, well my time's not ready. I'm not I'm not there yet, you know. Or maybe I never will be. Um, but so I think go go with your gut a little bit. Um, it's got to it's got to feel right and um, uh, yeah, just sometimes. And sometimes in the kitchen it can it can get all a bit samey um but keep um keep plugging away at it because because you're learning when you don't even realize that you're learning 
and and I always like to say like keep your eyes and ears open I think uh, especially if you know that you're going to want your own uh, restaurant someday that or your own business in, in food um, don't just don't just put your head in the in the chopping board kind of thing yes learn all of that and it's very important especially at the beginning but then you know keep your head up a little bit and and kind of realize what's going on around you and uh, especially in the pressurized situations, why are those decisions being made? And sometimes it can feel like um, someone more senior to you will make a make a judgment on something or make a call on something, and, and you think it's unfair. But maybe stop and think about why they're doing that, um, and try and learn from that process. Yeah. So uh, yeah, just to finish up, we were we were hopeful that we were going to get to collaborate with you this year at the college. Which, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so Simon sent a message to say sorry, it's uh, kind of fallen through, and we'd love to to pick that up again next year, hopefully. But we'll uh, we'll have to yeah, see how things get. For sure, um, progress. But, as, soon as, as soon as we can all get back to cooking, I'd I'd love to. Yeah, brilliant. But um, yeah, just to finish up, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure to have you here, and it's and your journey is inspiring. So it's good for for everyone to hear. And we, we sincerely wish you the best of luck as hopefully things start to to return to some level of normality. Yeah. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, yeah. <laughs>